Uh, good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they might affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items three and four in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. The uh, principal item of business today is to hear evidence in relation to the committee's inquiry on air quality in Scotland. We're joined by Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham, the Minister for Transport and Islands, Hamza Youssef, Neil Ritchie from the Environmental Quality Division, Andrew Taylor, Air Quality Policy Manager, and we will be joined by Yvette Shepherd, the Environment and Sustainability Manager of Transport Scotland, who has been uh, detained en route. Um, members have a series of questions for both yourself, Cabinet Secretary, and you, Minister. Obviously, we would appreciate the relevant person responding to the question. Um, kicking us off is Mark Roscoe. Thank you, uh, Convener, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, we've got a situation in Scotland where four out of our six areas are uh, breaching the uh, European Ambient Air Quality Objective. Uh, obviously, there's a human cost to that as well. People are dying as a result. Um, can I ask you, how confident were you before the summer that Scotland would have achieved the legal compliance by 2020? And how confident are you now, post the announcement of the programme for government, that will meet that compliance by 2020? I think we uh, are confident uh, about that. I mean, um, our air quality already compares pretty well with uh, the rest of the UK um, and, and Europe. Um, and in kind of some areas we're already compliant. So we're, we're you know, we're, we, are, we are, we think, um, uh, um, in, in a relatively good place. Um, the, the programme for government, additional measures, um, I think will ensure that that uh, uh, is 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 motoring on. I, I don't think anybody um, would uh, try to say that there aren't some issues continuing. Of course there are, um, but we believe they are manageable with the right actions. So, so how confident are you right now that we'll we'll meet? those air quality objectives by 2020? What, well, I'm what? as confident as I can be. Right. I mean, I, I, I can't foresee the future, but I, I'm as confident as I can be that we are in the, on the right track to do so and that the actions and the number of the things within programme for government, uh, you know, help that considerably. Um, uh, um, so I, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't really say much more than that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're keeping things uh, under review all the time. Um, and as I indicated, because of what's in the programme for government, I think that has helped in a lot of cases to considerably uh, up the understanding and awareness. Mm -hmm. And I've been uh, heartened by the extent to which, for example, local authorities are wanting to talk about low emission zones and actively engage on that. And that is the kind of action which will make a difference, particularly in those areas where there's been some, uh, that, where there continue to be problems. So uh, out of those four areas then that are breaching the EU limits, I mean, uh, are you equally confident that they will be sorted by 2020? Or are there particular issues, say, with Glasgow or North East, or have you, have you the same degree of confidence across those four areas that are breaching legal limits? Uh, well, I have as much confidence as I can have at this point that, that we will be able to achieve that. But of course, this is a partnership and uh, it does involve the engagement and the active uh, involvement uh, of others, including local authorities. And as I indicated, I'm already um, uh, pretty pleased that uh, that what's happening with, within local authorities suggests that they have become very much more uh, on top of this, uh, of this debate. Now, I think it's fair to say that the whole issue of air quality has moved rapidly up the agenda uh, over the last few years, um, and I'm only glad that we are now able to have a conversation across a variety of different partners where people understand the seriousness of the issue 
and the need to do things uh, about it. Now, one of the reasons why um, uh, uh, we were uh, keen that Glasgow should be the, the first low emission zone uh, was precisely because of the nature of, of some of the hotspots in Glasgow. And I don't think anybody would disagree that that was like an area that had to be tackled first. But equally, um, we have Edinburgh on board now wanting to talk uh, 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 very quickly about some of the issues that are, are happening within Edinburgh. And there are very particular, specific sets of issues in all of these different areas. So um, I, I think the, the conversation, I mean, I, I, I can only relate this to when I was last doing this job, if, if you like, and you know, my recollection of 2009-11 was that air quality was was not in not in the same place on the agenda in terms of tackling, um, and uh, I think we've we've moved enormously since then. Um, there's been uh, enormous improvement, and yes, there is still more to come. So I'm as confident as I can be that by 2020 um, uh, we will be uh, compliant. But uh, I can't categorically uh, make a promise that, I, you know, I mean, that's looking, that's a crystal ball time. I mean, I, I can't look into the future and I don't know what things might happen in the meantime. Things might rapidly get much better <laughs> um, given some of the actions that we're already taking. So at this point, it's, uh, there's, there's, there continues to be a degree of uncertainty around that. Uh, all we can do in government at the moment is get ourselves in the right place, start taking the right actions and ensure that everybody's on board with that and that's how we'll make the, the difference. So you talked about the agenda moving quite rapidly. Clean Air for Scotland was produced in 2015. On, in light of the programme for government, new commitments, in light of the UK Supreme Court uh, judgment on the adequacy of UK plans, including our own plan, is now the right time to review Clean Air for Scotland? Well, the, the judgments weren't specifically about what was happening in Scotland. Um, uh, we are uh, uh, keeping Clean Air for Scotland under constant review, uh, and I think the expectation is that by 2020 we would be looking to do more of a complete uh, uh, refresh, but it's being looked at constantly. Um, it, we didn't regard this as a static document, so um, we are we are constantly um, concerned to make sure uh, that it does keep up to date. And yes, there have been things that have changed. And one of those things, I think, has been um, everybody's understanding of the impact on public health, for example, um, of poor air quality. I think that's become much more widely accepted and understood at the moment um, than, than it might have been uh, um, even five years ago. And in terms of the actions that are in section 14 of uh, Clean Air for Scotland, I mean, obviously some of these will be updated now because they interrelate to the programme for government, but uh, are those actions being delivered? Are all of those being delivered? And I noticed that a number of them are on the transport side. Um, and is there budget and is there time to deliver those? Um, well, um, a lot of those actions are uh, in, you know, will have been delivered. Um, I'm looking at Neil. I think a number of them will have been delivered already. A number of them are actually in the process of being delivered. You're right, the programme for government does have quite a big impact on, on uh, uh, a lot of them. Uh, uh, um, and that, you know, we continue to keep those under review. Um, Hamza might want to say something about um, any of the specific uh, transport uh, actions, but... Uh, um, you know, we are, we are, I mean, that in a sense is the checklist that we are looking at all the time. In terms of is there anything that's causing concern at the moment? Um, I don't think there's anything very specifically that's causing concern. I mean, obviously, when we see figures like we did this year, we need to go back and have a look and see if there are particular reasons that can be dealt with in a particular way. And I think, you know, one of the actions that, that, we're wanting to move on that will have an impact on those of the low emission zones and uh, you know everybody knows that that has become a much bigger um, more focused um, discussion and debate than it would have been um, a year 18 months ago so so that's important and that's the kind of action that will then shift I suspect quite a lot of the specific items on the uh, on the checklist forward um, but uh, uh, but as I indicated 
Um, you, I think 2020 was uh, at the point at which we would want to go back and have a look at the clean air, uh, clean air for Scotland and, and consider uh, the more wholesale update that, that might be required. And 2020, of course, is the point at which we would expect to see low emission zones in the four main Scottish cities um, as well. So that does seem to be a fairly useful point at which to, to look again at the strategy. Okay. Minister, do you want to respond to Mr Oscar's question? <clears throat> you know, only to, for the, for the interest of brevity, only to simply re-emphasise re what the Cabinet Secretary has already said, that a lot of the measures we're taking forward clearly rely on collaboration with local authorities. Uh, and therefore, there's some elements of that in which we're in control of, and we're working collaboratively with local authorities, but clearly the pace at which local authorities can move will be determined by a number of factors dependent on the local authorities. So, no, I don't have uh, any major concerns. I have to say I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about the engagement with local authorities uh, on low emission zones, on, for example, our, our, our um, ambitious plans for the introduction of uh, electric and, and low emission uh, zone, uh, low emission vehicles uh, as well. So, I mean, I, of course, we'll, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, uh, in committee, but uh, no, no, no major concerns, but simply a caveat that uh, not all of this and, and the pace of all of this is necessarily within our control, but certainly the close collaboration with local authorities and other partners makes that a lot easier. Perhaps I've added that when I talked about the review, I meant an actual formal review of CAFs. That, that would be a, 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 a properly formal, not simply a, not simply a kind of refresh, really. Mm. It's to, it would be a kind of substantive review. Okay. Mr. Roscoe, you? Um, just on that, that collaboration point that the Minister's just raised, I mean, I notice under Section 14, it's got a column funding, it's got ticks, it's got little asterisks, and it's also got dashes. So I presume the dashes are areas where there's a reliance on partnership funding, there's a reliance on commitment from other partners, and therefore there's perhaps more of a question mark over that delivery, or have I, have I read that wrong? Uh, it's okay, I'll, while you're <laughs> blowing your nose, I'll, I'll answer from the low emission <laughs> zone. I mean, e each of the actions, of course, uh, will, uh, will have their own uh, funding mechanisms and, and agreements and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, if I was to speak on, on, on low emission zone for just a second, uh, clearly uh, with the conversations of having local authority, there is a discussion there that, um, you know, we'd expect local authority, of course, to, to put up some funding, but clearly an expectation that government um, um, and bring, uh, comes forward uh, with funding uh, as well. So, you know, th th there's a very honest and frank conversation uh, around actions, and, and uh, obviously the budget is less than 10 days away, and that will give some more clarity uh, necessarily on, on budgets. Um, and there's also some actions which, again, clearly there's some internal work going on. So, again, our plans to phase out the need for petrol and diesel uh, cars and vans by the end of 2032 uh, is some internal work is, is being done on the milestones towards that, the funding, um, uh, the funding uh, that would need to be associated with that. Uh, and again, some of that will come centrally, of course, from, from government, but a lot of that uh, will be partnership working, active travel. The members more than aware of our uh, ambitious vision for active travel, uh, increased and doubled our active travel budget. Now, the Community Links and Community Links Scheme Plus, he knows, is done uh, through a match funding process with local authorities. So, uh, you know, some of that will be collaborative. Again, you know, going back to the point about whether any of that gives me concerns, uh, no, the conversations from, from a transport perspective anyway are going in a, a really positive direction. Okay, just, okay. just finally, um, there has been some increased spend in England and Wales on clean air zones, I think. So there should be some consequential monies that Scotland is due. Is that something that's been discussed in the Cabinet? And, and will that consequential money, if and when it arrives, be ring-fenced for work on air quality in Scotland? Um, well, um, you wouldn't expect me to be disclosing aspects of the budget before um, Budget Day. Um, I can confirm that um, budgetary matters are constant uh, discussion at Cabinet, and indeed um, this morning the Cabinet will be discussing the budget, okay. amongst other things. Thank you. Stuart Stevens. Uh, I just wanted to see if I've got absolute clarity on this. Is it correct that we will meet our 2020 targets if, with the present plans of the government and the present plans of local authority, if they are executed as planned, we meet 2020 targets? Yeah, as I understand it, that's exactly what this would be designed to do. That's um, fine. Okay, thanks. Let's move this on to uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. I've got a few questions just on 
um, policy integration at a Scottish, UK and an EU level. Most evidence that we've heard has said that the Scottish policy on this is well integrated into UK and EU approaches, but there are still um, differences in those approaches. How does the, the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister think um, that we can improve the transboundary impact of air pollution? How can we improve its assessment and how can we improve the way that we tackle that impact? Well, transboundary measurement is quite difficult because, you know, stating the obvious, yeah. air doesn't have a boundary. Um, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the sense that uh, uh, we are... Uh, Okay, and, and you know, I don't, I don't have a briefing about our geography, but I, but I think it's fair to say that that Scotland um, is geographically in a good place in terms of dealing with transboundary issues. Um, we might not be saying that if we were sitting in Cardiff discussing the Welsh boundary would be a very different issue. So I think we're, you know, from that perspective, um, uh, and that that's dealing, I, I guess, with the more localised air quality issues. Um, so we're not, you know, that's not such a, um, such a big problem. When you're dealing with a much more, um, I, I don't know what the, the right terminology would be. Uh, you know, for example, some of our air quality monitoring uh, system is to do with the volcanic action. Now, clearly there is absolutely nothing we can do uh, about some of the air quality issues that would derive from another volcanic uh, eruption in, for example, Iceland. So, so there are there are there are transboundary issues which are manageable, and transboundary issues which I suspect are not particularly manageable. Um, and from our perspective, the, the the trick is to try and ensure that in those areas where they are manageable, that we do what do what we can. But as I indicated, that the from our perspective, our border um, gives us a bit of an advantage because we're not dealing with massive air quality problems on either side of our border. Um, I mean, obviously, the EU directive is to work is working at a pan-European uh, level, and I've kind of already indicated that we're we're in a pretty good place in in respect of that. Um, uh, as I understand it, the EU directive um, measures something a little bit differently to the way we do uh, our measurements at local authority level, and there is a boundary <coughs> issue. Uh, you know, as between local authorities, so people tend to think of transboundaries as being the as being national boundaries, but there are also local authority boundaries, um, and, and the extent to which uh, some of that is being taken into account will depend entirely on how well local neighbouring local authorities are working across their boundaries on some of these issues. Nothing more to add to what Cabinet Secretary said, unless there's a specific. Transport related question. That's fine. I, I'll move on. And there is, I will leave a question on Brexit, which springs from that to my colleague David Stewart. Um, one of the comments from uh, Aber it was Aberdeen City Council said that the, the legis, legal status of the standards and objectives within the Scottish regulations and the EU statutory duties can be confusing to the public, businesses such as bus operators and road haulage companies and other stakeholders. Currently, do you think that there are adequate resources being directed um, towards guidance and information for the public, businesses and other stakeholders? Um, and secondly, and this is perhaps directed more at the Minister, which are the most difficult sectors to influence positively when it comes to um, air pollution? Is it bus providers, freight, private vehicles? <coughs> So the two questions there in terms of resources towards guidance and then secondly, sectors that are difficult to influence. I mean, obviously, SEPA has a significant role to play in, uh, in respect of uh, overall guidance, um, as you would expect me uh, to say. And there are some uh, real opportunities uh, arising out of SEPA's ability um, to, uh, to help local authorities in terms of, um, in terms of uh, modelling. Um, yes, I think I already referred to the fact that between the EU and the domestic, there are slight differences in the way and in what is 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 being uh, measured. Um, some of that has been because we've um, we've taken a kind of higher standard. Uh, I think on particulate matter, for example, Scotland has gone further 
um, uh, than, uh, than, for example, the EU directive would have indicated, but I'm hoping people are happy that we've done that and not disappointed. Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, there are slightly different requirements um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, managing that. Um, I, I guess you're right in asking about how well understood that is out beyond those who have a professional interest. I would imagine that there's kind of levels of understanding uh, and I suppose from my perspective and I'll let Hamza deal with some of what he thinks you know specific sectors might be involved here but from my perspective I think the biggest challenge here is to get this issue across to the wider public who who don't necessarily relate their actions to the problem so they may have a real concern about the problem but they're not yet necessarily connecting the two issues. Um, and so I think that that, um, that ability to persuade the wider public that they do have a role to play here is probably one of our, our biggest challenges. And I would hope um, that local authorities um, are very much across that because of course people will relate very locally in local areas to local problems, the kind of things that Mark Ruskell flagged up, those areas um, uh, uh, from the sense of the broader public um, should be able to be turned into proper conversations about how to manage those problems. I suspect the move towards low emission zones is going to help generate a far better conversation about what is needed. I don't know, Hamza, if you want I, to. I agree entirely. I think if I take it a step back, um, I would say that I've been really heartened by the approach of local authorities. And uh, that's of all different political colours in relation to tackling this problem and this issue. You know, to, to, to the extent where there's been a really quite welcomed competitive edge, as it was, you know, between some of the cities about uh, low emission zones and you know, particularly between Glasgow and Edinburgh, I suppose they always have a bit of a competitive edge between each other. But, uh, you know, this, this, this um, determination to, to, to be as a, a more ambitious than the other on low emission zones, I think is something really, really welcomed and not something we would have seen, as the Cabinet Secretary has already said, <clears throat> five years ago, maybe even three years ago. So really heartened, first of all, by um, what is a shift in the, the discourse between policymakers, whether it's at a Scottish government level, um, a local government level, and, you know, from what I hear from, from, from the UK government uh, as well, moving in, 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 in a certain direction. Where we have the biggest challenge, I entirely agree with the Cabinet Secretary, is taking the public uh, with us. Uh, let's just you know be very frank about it. Uh, one of the biggest challenges will be dealing with the issue of the private motor car. Um, Listed Glasgow as, a, as an example, my home city, I have 12,000 cheap car parking spaces in the city centre. If I wanted to, if I parked on the fourth floor of Buchanan Gallery's car park, I could almost literally take my car into the till of John Lewis, almost, if I wanted to. And that would cost, you know, almost the same as the bus fare would cost me for an all-day ticket on a Sunday if I was to do it. So there's challenges there that we have to tackle, but the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely correct that low emission zones are the right are a step in the absolute right direction. Now, I'm not suggesting that those 12,000 car parking spaces uh, will be removed at all, but what I'm simply suggesting is that if you could have that easy access into the city centre with your private vehicle at the time of your choosing, getting you from A to B, you have to ensure that if you're going to put some sort of restrictions around that, uh, in terms of low emissions or any other restrictions, you have to ensure that the public transport is absolutely fit for purpose. So that's coupled or aligned with an improvement in public transport access, but also uh, aligned with making it easier to make the transition to, for example, electric vehicles, which again is something we may well talk about through incentivising uh, the, the, the purchase uh, or the leasing of electric vehicles or, or ultra low emission uh, vehicles. So changing the, 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 the behavioural change in amongst the public um, is going to be uh, a challenge, but it's something that we have to get the narrative right, because I think the Cabinet Secretary is right. I think people are very, very supportive of doing something to improve the air quality. Again, as, as a Glaswegian, you know, uh, many people I talk to in my constituency, you know, they'll tell you that they can almost literally taste the difference in the air when they go into Hope Street or Union Street in Glasgow. You know, you just, you just have to walk there and you, you realise it is an air quality issue. Um, so th there's a real understanding from the public that we have to do something 
couple that with the action that needs to be taken, it's, 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 it's not quite there. That, that, um, that link uh, is not quite made. And I think there's a power of work for the government to do, actually, as well as our partners and local authorities uh, and others. I do think things are changing, I have to say, but certainly it will take political courage at a local level and the national level to put forward some of these measures uh, and other measures, uh, I should say, that will ha help us to tackle, uh, worsen, uh, tackle the issue of, of air quality. Can I ask you, the question sort of touched on specific sectors. If you take the city of Glasgow, I think it's the case that Glasgow City Council uh, brought in a, an incentive scheme for retrofitting of buses some time ago and had zero take up. Doesn't that cause you a little bit of concern as we move into a, a, an area where we need to incentivise and encourage the bus companies to uh, look at their fleet? It doesn't cause me concern from the point of view that uh, re-emphasising what the Cabinet Secretary has said previously, what I've just said, that I think the discourse nationally has moved on. So whenever I talk to bus operators, uh, whether it's uh, Ed and Lothian, McGill's first stagecoach or the smaller players uh, on the market, all of them are greening their fleet in one way, shape or form. Now, some of them are doing that with the help that we provide with the Green Bus Fund. Some of them, th them are doing that uh, of their own back and spending... Uh, of course, uh, the, the, their own money, their own profits uh, to do that. Um, many of the bus companies I talk to are interested in some sort of retrofitting scheme, and we've already put a, uh, an amount of money uh, towards that. But other bus companies say to me that actually, instead of a retrofitting scheme, we'd rather just have help with subsidising the cost of Euro uh, 6 and Euro 6 buses or, or even uh, fully electric uh, buses. So for different companies, there's different solutions, and I think our fund... Uh, will be well used already as the Green Bus Fund. <coughs> I don't have the exact numbers here somewhere, but you know we've uh, you know uh, helped to green over 360 odd uh, vehicles uh, to date. So you know we had a good take up uh, of, the, of the Green Bus Fund. So I don't doubt that when we have a, a kind of retrofitting and abatement uh, fund, then it will be well used. So 362 buses uh, to date through the Scottish Green Bus Fund, the 16.2 uh, million. So no, no, I don't have too many concerns now. Okay, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, it's a question for the Transport Minister. Uh, following the Ayafiala yokel uh, eruption there was in Iceland, uh, huge disruption to air services, but in particular our lifeline services to the islands and to Campbelltown, uh, where because the number of passengers are low, they were well down the priority list for working out mitigations. Are we clear that if there were to be a future similar eruption, in any part of the world that affected us, we're better prepared at UK government level and at airline level. From an, avi from an aviation point of view, uh, <coughs> you know, the member's absolutely correct that you know, from each of these incidents that take place, we have to learn and, and of course make our strategies more robust. The, the difficulty we have in some of this, and the member knows this only too well, that when it comes to our lifeline services, our, our air services to our islands, um, there is some need to invest in, in the fleet because you have an ageing uh, you have a, a number of ageing uh, uh, planes uh, on the fleet. Uh, so there, there, there's the budgetary pressure that's on that. Uh, but there's other things that can absolutely be done from, from a UK point of view. He, sorry, from a constitutional point of view, of course, you'll know that uh, aviation regulation is uh, still reserved to, to, to the UK government. Uh, we have a good working relationship with the DFT in that regard. Uh, and, and we'll continue to work with them. But uh, yes, he's absolutely right. Uh, we have to continue to look at how to make our services uh, more robust in the light of, of recent incidents. We're doing that uh, in conjunction, as I say, with uh, not just the airlines involved, but our partners in the UK government. Uh, Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you. Um, on the back of Kate Forbes's question, um, I'd like to return to the issue of um, collaboration between local authorities. And I think the Cabinet Secretary is alive to that. It seems to me that's one of the biggest challenges here. How do you uh, ensure that there is consistency of approach between um, local authorities so that the bus that, for example, leaves East Kilbride to travel into to Edinburgh, which may cross you know, certain local authority boundaries, um, is not or, or is, is, is that there is a policy and framework in place that allows, allows that to happen. I just wonder if you have any further observations, just obviously acknowledging the challenges, but do you have any further observations about how those relationships are managed? Well, that sounds more like a question for the Transport Minister, because that really is about the integration mm -hmm. almost of... of, yeah, of I can, speak to, that. I, I can speak to that. Uh, what I would say to, to the member is, well, there's no magic wand. 
Uh, if we had one, we would use it in terms of uh, complete alignment between Scottish government's ambitions and vision uh, and, and the local government's actions and, and vision. But what I would say is in order to better align that, uh, there's been an opportunity, I think, since the local elections in, in May uh, this year where we have a number of new administrations. Uh, even those administrations that have continued with the same political leadership, uh, they have many of them appointed new transport, elect, uh, elected members as transport spokespeople, uh, coupled with and many administrations, long-serving uh, chief operating officers of, of, of transport at official level. So what we did recently, just a, a number of weeks ago, was uh, I co-hosted an event with COSLA uh, in Edinburgh where we brought those transport spokespeople, the elected members, the officials together, along with RTPs, uh, Regional Transport Partnership uh, chairs and, and, and so on, and we brought together, uh, along with other stakeholders, Solus, Scots, and we had a really frank and honest discussion about what the government's ambitions were in terms of transport, decarbonising transport, as well as active travel and a few other things. And we heard from them where they thought the challenges were, uh, whether that was on funding, whether that was on other mechanisms, whether that was on ambition, scale of ambition, guidelines, uh, TROs, you name it. A really, as I say, frank, robust uh, conversation uh, and, and if we have more of those conversations then we'll be better aligned now the cabinet secretary is leading and, and, and chairing and taking forward a steering group for the the four cities in relation to low emission zones uh, and taking that forward now that those kind of forums those spaces where we can speak very frankly in a private space as well is incredibly helpful to ensuring that we are we're aligned but there is uh, i would say to, to to the member no, no magic wand here and ensuring that uh, local government and, and, and scottish government necessarily uh, completely 100 percent aligned but i have to say as i have already said i'm extremely heartened optimistic and positive by what i've heard thus far and, and glasgow's connectivity commission for example only gives me further reason to be optimistic can I ask about a different element of the, the joined up approach? Um, we had evidence from one local authority that said that they believed there was a disconnect between policies directed towards local authorities on the one hand and policies toward it, uh, directed towards infrastructure, which is the responsibility of, of Transport Scotland on the other hand. Uh, are you content that policies are being consistently uh, delivered? Um, to address that kind of problem? Yeah, I'm not sure I entirely understand uh, the, the tenor of the question, so maybe I'd look again at the transcript in, in a bit more detail. But uh, most certainly, I mean, we know where our responsibilities are in terms of infrastructure. Uh, we know where the local government's uh, responsibilities lie, but where, for example, there is uh, ability to collaborate, take on road collaboration or, or, or maintenance. We have a, a conversation, we have a forum with, with local authorities and, and Transport Scotland. Uh, on that part of the infrastructure. Um, but when it comes to, again, if I took low emission zones as an example, th there's again an understanding from uh, local authorities that the government is going to have to step in and assist when it comes to the infrastructure of, of low emission zones, although they'll be on, on local roads. So, I, wouldn't, I mean, there'll always be some elements of tensions with local authorities and, and, and transport and, you know, um, th their desires and ambitions and, and our budgetary constraints and the processes within which we work. But um, I have to say, I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of too many... Uh, too many tensions and contradictions, but if he wanted to furnish me with more details, I could perhaps give a, a more specific example or answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning. Um, I know the question I'm going to ask you doesn't come under your remit, but it does affect air quality. Um, so, in regard to planning applications, previous witnesses have been asked if there are any examples where SEPA or Transport Scotland have stepped in on a local planning development plan to request a specific development should be removed on the grounds of the impact it would have on air quality. They said no. Um, basically, I want to ask, do you believe that planners should effectively evaluate the current uh, impacts of emissions, develop spatial plans that reduce human exposure, and what work is the Royal Town, do you believe the Royal Town Planning Institute, RTPI, should be doing to ensure that local strategic development plans are compliant with the uh, CAF's Clean Area for Scotland, especially when applications are now being proposed locally, re-local incinerators. 
Well, I, I think as the member knows, neither the minister nor myself are responsible for Scotland's planning system. Yeah. Um, from Certainly. the perspective of my portfolio concerns, I would uh, not just hope, but expect that planning uh, uh, decisions are being made um, with environmental, climate change and air quality considerations fully taken on board. What I'm not in a position to be able to give to the committee is a, a long list of, of planning decisions where that might have happened or people feel it should have happened and didn't happen, etc. So uh, I would and expect that planning authorities have all of these issues. And it's not just to do with air quality. I'm indicating environmental um, priorities and climate change should all be part and parcel um, of what they are now considering. Um, the extent to which the RTPI is or is not issuing professional guidance on some of this, I'm afraid I can't answer. Um, I can either try to find out a more detailed response for you or pass the query to the planning minister, who I understand is actually in doing a statement this afternoon, if I'm, if I'm correct, on planning policy. So, um, I mean, I, I appreciate that planning considerations can be extremely important. And we would be looking for uh, an understanding of the need for green infrastructure, for example. We would be looking for uh, uh, planning authorities to be thinking about all of these things, to be, um, to be designing. Um, I mean, my particular concern is that we ensure that when, when new um, housing developments are in place, that there's an understanding of transport issues and all of the rest of it as being part and parcel of that. But it's not really for my portfolio specifically to deal with the day-to-day -day planning yeah. issues I, that I, are I, raised. I, I said that right at the very start of my question, mm. and, and I agree with you, it's not in your portfolio, but at the end of the day, air, air quality is, and sometimes planning can affect it. So what would be your view on suggestions there have been a lack of example of intervention in development decisions that may impact on air quality, whether by SEPA uh, or Transport Scotland or local authorities? Well, I, I'm sorry, but I can't really answer that question if I don't have some specific idea of what it is you're actually talking about in particular areas, and well, I would need to go away and have and examine a particular planning decision in those circumstances. I mean, I, if you want, if there are particular ones that, that are of concern, I'm happy if they're flagged up and we can, we can go away and have a look depending on which issue or is the one that's concerning people and, and come back with some kind of response on those, but I, I'm not really in a position to talk in general terms well, I, about uh, planning. The, the, there's one which maybe, um, uh, the Minister of Transport could, could possibly answer, and I'll, I'll um, rejig the question I was going to ask. When it comes to a planning application where there's a multiple housing development, um, but there's no transport going to that area, buses, etc., so everyone jumps in their car mm. and their air quality shoots up because everyone sh can't get them. Should we discuss with... Um, local providers that, um, well, you know, move your um, transport route and, and take in that, that housing development. W you know, would that improve air quality? So I'll need to speak in, 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 the, in the general, and I appreciate the members asking the question in, in, in the general as well. The first thing to say is obviously local authorities um, have uh, their air management uh, plans and strategies at, at, at a local level, many of them particularly in, in air management quality areas. And so therefore, there's already uh, guidelines there and, 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 and measures they should be taking in order to ensure that they're not significantly worsening any air quality issues. But what I would say in the general is I've had a good number of conversations with Kevin Stewart, the Minister who's taking forward. Uh, the planning <coughs> review, and the member will be heartened to know that it's cross-government working when it comes to the planning review. And that's been one of the general criticisms that people uh, have had as I've travelled around to local authorities or even RTPs. Um, <coughs> but when I've spoken to communities, they don't feel necessarily that there's, uh, they, they, there's enough consideration of transport matters when it comes to large uh, developments, not just from a an air quality perspective, but from a traffic management perspective uh, as well. So uh, all I can do at this stage is give the member some reassurances that from my point of view, we're speaking closely with the minister in charge of this, 
and we're hoping for uh, a little bit more in terms of uh, you know tightening up uh, some of the measures around transport and the expectations around transport. There's obviously a very fine line here, which I know the member appreciates, having been in <coughs> local government <coughs> for many years before this, which is you know setting, of course, appropriate national guidelines, expectations, but at the same time allowing flexibility at a local level because local authorities should know uh, best. And many of these issues should, you think, be covered at, at pre-application stage, for example, you know, there's the, 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 environment, the environmental impact assessment as well. So there are already measures there, but, you know, I appreciate the, the tone of which the member's asking the question is, can more be done, should more be done? And I think from a planning perspective, not speaking for Mr Stewart at all, but I think we both recognise that, uh, you know, that is why we're doing a planning review. Can, can <coughs> I just add a little bit to that? Because it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I'm not sure who was asking the question about the... The, the areas where I think a lot of more work needs to be done. And one of the, in, in terms of public engagement particularly, one of those areas I think, and it is relevant to this question, is if, if we could get the public to engage much more actively at the, at the point where um, local authorities are doing their local development plans, because frequently local authorities do set up meetings, they're not well attended, people don't actually register what's in that plan, and then ultimately when, when a, a, an application goes in and it gets agreed, there's a bit of a hoo-ha because folk have not really... So I think there are some real issues here about public engagement at a very early stage, and the local development plan stage is that stage, but we still have a difficulty engaging the public at that level. A question wants, wants to come in. Before he does, uh, uh, Minister, can I sort of raise a point that, about this conversation with other ministers in, in, in relation to this? Presumably, you would be quite delighted if going forward it was a requirement of all planning consents for new built housing that electric charging points were included, whether it be standalone houses or, or flats, that type of thing. So, I mean, those conversations going on. Absolutely. Um, state that those conversations are going on and I know this for a fact because I have been chewing Kevin Stewart's ear for a considerable time about a range of issues it's not just about the one that you raised but there are a range of issues um, where I would like to see uh, some things and I know that we haven't got to the actual Brexit question but I am aware that in 2019 I think it is the EU intends to bring forward a directive which will um, seek to uh, uh, ensure that no new build, whether domestic or commercial, um, proceeds without electric vehicle charging um, as, as, a, as an absolute basic standard. Now, I raised that with Kevin Stewart some time ago, um, and that may be the kind of Brexit-related issue that we're, we would want to say, notwithstanding the fact that that directive is coming in potentially post-Brexit, that seems like something that we would want to do Anyway, and, and so I have these conversations with Kevin Stewart all the time. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Hamza Yusuf isn't having these same conversations with Kevin Stewart all the time. Um, uh, so, yes, I mean, we are very well aware that, that planning considerations, whether it be of the kind that Richard Lyle has raised or future potential uh, planning things, um, are, are important in this debate. Okay, Mark Roscoe. Just to follow on from uh, Mr. Lyle's uh, questioning there, I mean, the, the, there's local development plans, but there's also local transport strategies. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also some concerns there around the number of capital projects, when those capital projects were devised, perhaps in a different context, when we were less concerned or less aware of air quality issues. There's also issues there around democratic mm -hmm. deficit and perhaps some of the assumptions that are built into local transport strategies as well. So. I just wonder, kind of, to, to what extent is there proof checking of of local transport strategies uh, for air quality issues? I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the member maybe on, on the specifics, but I mean, it's not a, a case of you know proofing um, local uh, transport strategies. What we try to do is get alignment. So you'll probably be aware that there's a review of the national transport strategies we talk. The 60 stakeholders involved and in some of the, the numerous working groups on that. But COSLA and local authorities are key to that conversation. In fact, they co-chair uh, many of those uh, working groups and, and sit alongside me in terms of the partnership board. So there's already the purpose of doing that is to ensure that this integration of our national transport vision for the next 20 years 
and that filters through to local authorities uh, when it comes to revising their own national transport strategies. I mean, the member's general point here about um, you know local authorities doing a, a constant check of their transport strategies to ensure that they're uh, you know cognizant, aware, they're taking account of. Uh, environmental uh, issues I think is a good one uh, to make but I'm hoping with the, the National Transport Strategy Review uh, and, and, and COSLA being so uh, ingrained as part of that the review process that will have an effect on local Jack to local transport strategy if it was predicting levels of traffic growth which are out of line of the national transport well, strategy? We certainly don't predicate on, on increasing uh, traffic, and he knows that, whether it's on, on projects, for example, uh, such as, as the Queen's Ferry Crossing or even smaller infrastructure projects. So, yes, it would give me, certainly give me concern if uh, there was local transport strategies that were predicated on increasing uh, the amount of, uh, of car journeys, for example. That would, uh, yes, give me cause for, for, for concern. Okay. Thank you. Um, We've raised the B word. We better explore it. <laughs> David Stewart. Thank you, Kavira. The Cabinet Secretary has partially covered my question, um, but I was trying to look ahead uh, to a post-Brexit Scotland about where new first-class um, environmental directives were coming from Europe that Scotland decided to adopt. Could, can the Cabinet Secretary see a scenario where that could be part of an agreement on the basis that the 27 countries have immense expertise on the environment, and that's not taking away the immense uh, expertise we have in Scotland, but clearly there's a scale issue here, and you know the committee is fresh from coming back from Brussels, uh, so I think the jargon is uh, equivalence. Um, uh, could you see a scenario where we could follow in the future new environmental uh, directives which put stricter uh, limits on emissions, for example, within Scotland? That are well, that, that's precisely what I have said on a number of occasions is what I want to do, not just to continue with the... Um, the status quo, but to continue to improve um, as, mm. as and, and so that, you know, that whatever the status quo is at a particular time, I would not want Scotland to be lagging behind that. So it's not just about the position we're in at March 2019, but the, that, that changed position as it will change going forward. Um, what is interesting, actually, and I was in Brussels, well, I've obviously been in Brussels a fair bit, but one of the times I was in Brussels, I met with Green 10, um, the European level green kind of organisations. Um, and what's interesting is the extent to which they're a lot more sceptical about the EU's <coughs> green credentials. So um, we tend to look at this as, as the EU, in a sense, providing a, a, a kind of gold standard for us. Um, their argument in some areas might be, well, actually, um, the EU isn't going far enough either. So, so there are, you know, there are issues about that. But mostly, where, uh, in fact, I, I mean, I, I think I would struggle to think of an area of where there's been EU directives, in, certainly in this portfolio, that we in Scotland haven't gone further than the directive. And I would continue to want that to be, um, to be the case. The, the difficulty, I suppose, will be the extent to which we can stay connected to the conversations as they develop um, at an EU level. Um, and that's one of the things, and one of the reasons why I wanted to meet with the Green 10, one of the reasons why we're trying to continue um, uh, that level of engagement. So it's going to be extremely important that, you know, if we are out at March 2019, and I still harbour this small hope that everybody will see sense before then, but if we are out in March 2019, having developed other linkages was, is going to become extraordinarily uh, important and establishing ways in which we continue to become connected or, or, or aware of and communicate with the developments as they take place um, within the EU as well. So I'm very, very conscious of that as being an absolute priority and it's one of the key things that I've been saying um, and saying consistently and will continue to say consistently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. John Scott. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, convener. Um, I want to ask about LEZs quite specifically, um, probably a question for Minister Humza, um, but I'd like to try and nail him down on some of the specifics as best we can. Um, and so, in terms of detail, um, when does the Scottish Government anticipate that an LEZ will be in place in each of Scotland's four largest cities? Have you got a time for each one? I think we've already said that in the programme for government, but the four biggest cities by, by 2020, and the first one 
uh, as we've said, uh, introducing it by, by 2018 in Glasgow, uh, has recently been named as, as the location uh, for that first uh, low emission zone. And the other also, cities? I've also already had um, meetings with Edinburgh in respect of theirs. Um, so th this will now be a, a, a rolling conversation. I don't think any of the cities particularly wants to get left behind. Yeah, and I should have said that. I mean, after 2020, the, the, the focus is on the other air quality uh, management areas by 2023. Okay, right, thank you very much. And uh, what resources is the Scottish Government making available to support the development and implementation of the LEZ in Glasgow and then the other three cities? I think it's a really good question and, and I just want to hark back to, to what I said previously, which is the collaboration between ourselves and the cities has been really positive and the engagement has been really, really positive. Um, he'll appreciate we're less than 10 days away from the budget, so I'm not going to give him specifics in terms of, of, of numbers, despite uh, his, his best efforts. But there's an understanding from the Scottish Government that clearly we're going to have to provide some element of funding. Now, that um, element of funding, whether that is to help and assist with infrastructure in terms of making it enforceable, whether that's in relation to, for example, we've already talked about bus retrofitting or helping with uh, the subsidy for greening the fleet, uh, whether that's for any other element of low emission zones, that's a conversation that's currently taking place. Now, clearly, again, that will depend on the geographic scope, uh, the phasing of low emission zones as local authorities see them. But to give some reassurance to, to, to the member, there's no doubt that the Scottish Government is going to have to contribute financially towards uh, the implementation of, of, of low emission zones in some way, shape or form, and budget hopefully will give some more detail of that. And, and we'd expect, of course, local authorities to also come forward with funding too. And that will be, that commitment then will be in the budget rather than your statement on Thursday? Again, I wouldn't want to preempt uh, either of them. Uh -huh. Well, we are up within almost 12 months of um, this um, being delivered in Glasgow. Um, and as far as I'm aware, and certainly Friends of the Earth suggest that there's no commitment as yet um, to funding. Um, there's nothing tangible, so. Well, there, ha there has been some commitments to some elements of funding. For example, 1.6 million to support the first phase of the bus emission uh, abatement retrofit programme, which is not I admit, the easiest mouthful for a fund, but uh, that fund will help in terms of bus operators. So we're already, it's, it's in, in, in one way, putting our money uh, where our mouth is, but, but clearly he, he understands I've got a statement coming up, there's the budget statement. Uh, but I would give him absolute reassurance that we are positively engaging with local authorities on the funding question. So he's right to push, but I would suggest him and, and the, the answers to that should, should uh, start to, to become fairly apparent. But there's a good conversation happening with local authorities and we'll continue uh, in that vein. Okay. Uh, uh, Donald Cameron. I appreciate you can't preempt the budget and you can't preempt your statement, but can you commit to um, giving the public and Parliament a fully fledged costing of the LEZ in Glasgow and who will bear and, and the parties who will bear the cost of that in the very near future? We should absolutely be transparent and as transparent uh, as possible. Uh, in relation to the finance, uh, the scope of the LEZ and so on. And I think the member will appreciate some of this will, you know, we have to have a, have to have a safe space to be able to speak to local authorities about uh, their ambitions for a low emission zone where uh, we think they should uh, perhaps go further, where they think we should go further in respect to finance and funding. And those conversations have to take space, as I say, take place in, in, in a safe space. But of course, once that's agreed between local authority and, and government, uh, yes, I mean, the member's absolutely correct. I think through the, the appropriate processes, that will be made obvious and, and, and made uh, transparent. Can, can I just return to the issue about the Green Bus Fund? And I hear what you're saying, Minister, about not preempting the budget or your statement on Thursday, but just a point that comes to mind. There is no bottomless pit of money here. There will be a limit to what the Green Bus Fund can offer. Is there a, a risk that you may have to restrict access to the Green Bus Fund or you may restrict access going forward um, in order to support bus operators in the urban settings, particularly where we're going to have to to establish LEZs? Well, 
the message to the, to the bus operators has been, and, and I think they understand this, and, is that they've also got to put their money where their mouth is too, and they're doing that to, to, to a large extent. And I'm really impressed, I have to say, having visited, uh, you know, first stage coach McGill's uh, Lothian buses in particular, having visited th th those four big companies of their plans to green their fleet. Um, so they're already understanding this is the direction the government's moving in. Their appeal to me and equally to Glasgow City Council, for example, and I'm sure it's replicated to other local authorities, is give us an appropriate amount of time to phase this in. We can't, you know, can't introduce and, and build these buses, or get these buses built overnight. Um, however, you know, we want to be careful to, of course, be understanding of that, but at the same time, make sure those uh, th those uh, timelines are very robust. So, uh, so if the answer is direct question, then clearly it will be limited by the amount of funding that there is and therefore we'll want to look at how we can get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, the green um, incentive for, for, for the BSOG grant is probably an example of that. We're looking to review that and, and within that review we're thinking, um, you know, again without committing and, and preempting, we're thinking of how do we tier that so that, for example, the greatest amount of help is given to Euro 6 as opposed to, you know, Euro 4 or so on and so forth. So but that, that's, that's what kind of Conversations are in consideration at the moment. Again, not a final decision that, that has been made in those. So, yes, we will have to be, uh, you know, will be restricted by by the amount of funding, of course. But also, we are looking to see how we can make that pound go go further. Okay, thanks, Mr. Scott. Thank you very much. Um, 2018 is not far away. Um, so, when do you anticipate that the enforcement of the LEZ will begin? in Glasgow, that we, we've heard that the funding is now going to be in place. Uh, when will the enforcement actually start? Have you a date mm. for that? I mean, it's a, it's a good question, and he's right, of course, 2018 uh, isn't uh, far away. I, I would remind him that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when we say, in, uh, when we say 2018, uh, you know, it could be any time in, the, in, in 2018, of course. Yes, we know Glasgow that. Glasgow yeah. is very, uh, ha have said to me that that's uh, an ambitious target. But it's definitely one, of course, that we're committed to and, and, and working towards. What I would say on the enforcement point, uh, I'm sure the committee is already aware of this, but if you look at examples of low emission zones across the United Kingdom, there's been a phased approach towards enforcement. I, I think that's a wholly sensible approach. Now, clearly, again, it will be for Glasgow to determine the scope, the phasing, the enforcement, etc., etc. It will be for them to come to the government in collaboration and say, right, this is our plan. They've already got initial proposals, which are very high level and, and, and broad brush, um, but they'll start to put more meat on the bones as they're doing uh, already and come with more details on that. But I think a phased approach to uh, enforcement is an absolutely uh, correct one. It's clearly been working in, in, in other parts of, of the United Kingdom uh, and in the European continent, and, and I'd expect them to take that phased approach. It's sensible for... For, for, for drivers of the private motor car, it's sensible for the points I've already mentioned to the convener in relation to, to the bus industry uh, as well. But uh, clearly, you know, uh, behavioural change will be an important part of that uh, early conversation and then phasing enforcement thereafter. So I couldn't give them an exact date and a timeline for enforcement because that will be for Glasgow City Council, really, to, to determine in their proposals and for us to collaboratively uh, agree. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, we do note there's a need for a phased approach and we're very grateful for the Greater London Authority and Transport for London sending us a submission in this regard where they much talk about a phased approach and the need for it. And from that, one can only imagine that it's going to be a very tight time scale and the fact that um, you are um, not able to give us a date for when the enforcement will begin um, I would have thought it would concern you because you're putting out the money and you would want to know when the results would be delivered. And certainly there's a huge amount of um, in people in industry, in, in transport, in, in the bus sector, who would, who would, it's absolutely critical that they know as soon as possible that they have a deadline that they're working to. Um, the, the, we are committed to introducing Scotland's first low emission zone by about 2018. In terms of the enforcement, see, the, the, the success of a low emission zone is not the amount of fines that are chalked up. In fact, the exact opposite. You know, less fines than we know that it's, it's, it's working. So the point of, of, of enforcement, of course, is, is absolutely important. But I think a pragmatic approach is the submission you've received from, from Greater London Authority 
uh, will, will demonstrate uh, that their phased approach is sensible. Now, um, the money and the funding that we're going to put up, in my opinion, that will go towards assisting with things like, for example, the infrastructure to assist with the enforcement, uh, but also what we've already discussed, incentivising transport operators to green their, their fleet bus operators uh, in particular, but it may also go to other uh, elements of infrastructure as well. So I don't have concerns about, I'm not going to release the, the, the funding without, of course, a, a detailed conversation with Glasgow City Council and Donald Cameron's point about giving transparency around that, I think, is a good one. But let's just not confuse that the, the, the success of an LEZ is simply down to, uh, for example, how much fines it, it chalks up. That, that would be a wrong uh, approach to, to take. Um, right. Um, thank you. And so... You are confident then, I think you said by 2018, so by the end of 2018 is what I would take from what you've just said. For introducing the law mission zone. Uh, right, and so that's not the enforcement by the end of 2018. No, that's not what we, a, a phrased no. approach to enforcement will be necessary, and I think it's for Glasgow to come forward as the okay. first law mission zone to suggest when that enforcement would take place, and of course we'll do that in conversation and concert, and once there's some more detail and finality about that, then we're able to, of course, uh, ensure that that's uh, very much in the, in the public domain. OK, thank you. And just returning to something you said earlier, I mean, you're confident then that all the infrastructure, there's time for the infrastructure to be put in place, the cameras, the, uh, the signage, um, within that sort of time scale, and also, the presumum, I'm presuming this is probably a daft laddy question, but that the legislative framework will also be in place by then. No, I think it's a very reasonable question to, to ask, and, and the answer would be yes. I mean, we'd expect, again, for, for the introduction of the low emission zone, that the appropriate legislation, of course, would be in place, but also, uh, where appropriate, the, the infrastructure would, would also uh, be in place. Right. And finally, um, should LEZs include private vehicles? I think you kind of alluded to that already with um, your remarks about John Lewis. Um, and should emissions be reduced per passenger or per vehicle? Um, on the question of, of the private motor car, yes, uh, I think I have probably answered that, but just to re-emphasise that uh, my steer to Glasgow and to other local authorities that I've spoken to is be as ambitious as possible. Again, understanding the need to phase, and, and that all makes sense to me, but uh, you know, it's very important that they're as ambitious as possible. I think from a perception point of view, it would look, you know, even the perception or presentation would look quite difficult, wouldn't it, if you had a, you know, a Euro 6 bus in, in a low emission zone, but next to it was, was a 20-year-old Land Rover, you know, that was chugging out heavy emissions. It just wouldn't look right uh, and it wouldn't really make much sense. So therefore, it certainly, to me, makes sense that you, you look at uh, the private motor car, you look at bus op, uh, buses, um, you look at any, you know, taxis and so on and so forth, you look at them uh, holistically and, and, and in the round. And um, again, that will require, as I say, phasing in, understand that, uh, and that will require uh, some element of, uh, uh, of uh, political courage, of course, uh, for that difficult conversation. Uh, I think in terms of the per passenger, per vehicle, again, I'll maybe refer to, to, to well, officials. Uh, in, that, in that respect, <laughs> uh, no, my, my officials uh, on the left here, but he'll be aware that we've just concluded a low emission zone consultation um, that concluded at the end of last month. Um, we've had something in the region of 600 responses to that, so we'll analyse that. Of course, we'll give feedback to the committee and parliament, but I don't know whether Yvette wants to add any more in particular uh, on this issue. I think the, the consultation included questions around um, what vehicle types people felt should be in included within LAZ, so we will be analysed. That's one of the questions we will analyse um, in the consultation responses. What, what, what's the consideration around all vehicle types being included? Um, and that will feed into the um, National <coughs> Emissions Framework development in terms of guiding local authorities as they go forward. Have you any early thinking on that? What type of vehicle should be included, notwithstanding the consultation? I think we'd reflect back to, to Mr Yusuf's point about um, anticipating local authorities being ambitious and taking account of all the vehicle types that they need to include to make sure they can deliver the objective of the LEZ. Um, and that involves SEPA and the modelling and the science and the air quality issues being considered holistically. OK. Right, thank you very much. Finlay Carson. Uh, just regards to, to the LEZs, um, 
you know, we're, we're, we're seeing Glasgow is probably going to be the one that, that comes forward first. Um, and and we've, we've had some papers from Glasgow uh, councils suggesting that a lot of it's going to be based on modelling or whatever, and, and, and air quality uh, predictions can be based on um, you know, calculations. If the, the government are putting money into uh, LEZs, what uh, is the network going to do to ensure we don't have, in, in five years' time, five completely different ways of implementing LEZs uh, and five different databases and five different sets of cameras that do things in a different way? What, what sort of joined-up approach are you going to have and what network or framework is there going to be to ensure that we, a, a bit like the, the rollout of... Um, bin collections across the country where some local authorities have thrown money down the drain if they'd only been a national framework to work within there might have been some savings with, with more emphasis on big data and whatever what, what's the Scottish government going to do to ensure that there's not public money wasted by everybody trying to uh, reinvent the wheel every time they, they look at bringing in an LEZ mm. I think it's a good question and look again it goes back to something that I said uh, in my previous answer which was there has to be a, a fine balance, uh, fine line, sorry, that's walked uh, in relation to a national framework, which is important for the, all the reasons the members already highlighted, but allowing local authorities and local areas to have the flexibility. So we know one size doesn't always necessarily fit all. So there's got to be a, a given a bit of take on, on, on that. It's a fine line, as I say, to, to walk. And I think the member probably appreciates that. In terms of national national framework i do agree though there has to be some element of of, of national framework uh, and around that and you know if a, if a local authority in the future wants to decide to implement a low emission zone which we'd obviously welcome they have to be able to almost take off a shelf at least some element of a, a national framework so the consultation is important for that which i mentioned uh, has had 600 responses which is which is an excellent response uh, to that consultation, so that will clearly give some element of high-level, um, um, uh, high, high level objectives uh, that we have uh, and expectations of a low emission zone. But then also, what I've mentioned already, the, the cabinet secretary chairing that steering group that exists, a relationship group that exists between ourselves and the four uh, biggest cities uh, who have plans to introduce low emission zones by, by 2020. So that kind of collaborative conversation, I think once Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, uh, you know, once they have the low emission zones up and running um, by, by, by 2020 and introduced by, by 2020, I should say, then clearly that'll perhaps set the tone. But they have to just be careful here because what might work for those urban areas as a low emission zone might not always translate into working best for a rural setting, for example. I know a member will be more than aware of, of, of that particular point. So I just emphasise there has to be a balance here between national framework and giving local authorities the flexibility to design uh, a low emission zone that works for them. The Four Cities Leadership Group's having its first meeting this month. So I think once we've got the four cities round the table, um, precisely some of those questions are, are liable to be part of uh, what the discussion is. And while that doesn't necessarily mean that every other low emission zone that comes thereafter is, uh, is going to follow exactly the same mod uh, model, I would imagine that that is likely to set the the parameters within which it seems sensible. But I think it is a fair point to remember that some of the hotspots, some of the places on the hotspots list were, would have been surprising to quite a lot of people. So a low emission zone, you know, which is being considered for parts of Glasgow or parts of Edinburgh is going to be quite different in, in, in requirements to a low emission zone in some of the areas that are on uh, uh, on that top ten list, in which, one of which I happen to live in, <laughs> so, um, and that is going to be a challenge because the challenge of of managing, um, and some members will know what I'm talking about. The challenge of managing of managing that is going to be interesting. Um, thank you, convener. And just on that subject, cabinet secretary, um, and on Finlay Carson's point, developing that. Would you welcome, notwithstanding what the Minister has said about each local authority having the right to make its own decisions, um, a synchronicity of approach, as it were, between the four uh, cities so that there would be a, sort of a uniformity 
of approach where it's possible to achieve that? Would that be one of your high-level objectives? But I think that's one of the things that will be um, a matter for discussion for the Four Cities Leadership Group, because um, where possible, people will want to iron out any inadvertent uh, uh, issues that might arise, and you know some of the things that uh, Finlay Carson is, is, is uh, you know, is raising are exactly the sorts of things I should imagine officials and all the local authorities would be trying to avoid. Because quite apart from anything else, we all know that if you are looking for, um, uh, you know, um, technological uh, uh, input, uh, economies of scale do come into it. So rather than have lots of different models and everybody buying different things, there is a, there's a potential um, purchasing advantage of, of choosing a single model. The, the, the thing I was just trying to say in caution there is that there are some places where some of the fixes might have to be very different simply because of where they are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Minister, a few moments ago you used words like ambitious and political courage. Um, I'm just wondering if we are serious and ambitious about tackling air quality, should there not be a place for congestion charging and workplace parking levies? albeit, if it were possible, to have a dispensation where car sharing is involved. Don't we need to take such steps, however unpopular or uh, politically courageous they would be? Look, political courage is, is important for the reasons I've already mentioned. That, uh, although people are very sympathetic on the air quality point, um, you know, the, the, the actions that are needed to meet our ambitious targets at a local level and a national level are going to require some measures that some people will, frankly, uh, you know, uh, not be so enthusiastic about. And we already see some of that. I mean, I, I, I've spoken to some stakeholders when Glasgow was announced as the first low emission zone, who, as I say, were not particularly enthusiastic about this, um, the, business, the, the economic impact that they perceive to be on their businesses. Now, we have to make sure that we actually give them the, 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 the counter-argument, which is if we get this right, this will bring more people into our city centres and buses can carry way more people than a car can, for example. So we can get more bums on seats, means more people going to their shops, more ca people going to their cafes and, and more economic regeneration. Uh, for the city centres now, uh, our, t our town centres. Um, what I would say in terms of uh, workplace parking levies, for example, which is, is another measure mm -hmm. which uh, you know we've seen in the United Kingdom in Nottingham, if my memory serves me correct, mm -hmm. that uh, you know we made mention of this in the draft climate change plan. You know, we spoke about uh, workplace parking levy, levy, and that I have to say once again I'm heartened by the number of local authorities who have approached me, and it maybe I'll be the same for the cabinet secretary. I'm not sure, but have approached me and said. When are we going to start introducing the legislation around this? We're quite keen to explore this. We're keen to look at this, keen to learn from Nottingham and bring it up to XYZ local authorities. So I think there's a there's a real desire there to, to, to be a leader uh, in some of this in Scotland, and I'm very pleased uh, around that. Uh, you know, congestion charging, as you know, isn't part of uh, our, our policy. Uh, and, and what I would say is that low emission zones, though, really have the ability to help us to get to our outcomes uh, in a way which I think is palatable to the public, but also very, very ambitious uh, as well. And that's where the emphasis lies at the moment. Uh, in terms of um, the freight consolidation centres option, um, what progress has the, the government made in exploring the role that that might play in assisting us in this journey? Conversations. I have to say that the evidence on, on consolidation centres can be a bit mixed. Uh, you get a, a number of uh, uh, you know, pieces of evidence that will suggest that uh, they're very good, of course, for an urban environment. But many others are suggesting that um, <coughs> they don't quite uh, have the impact that you might first envisage when you hear about them. So uh, internal conversations are happening about freight cons consolidation centres. What I would say on, on, on freight, perhaps more uh, with more enthusiasm, is that um, <coughs> our discussions about moving freight from road to rail are going very well. And uh, we are on, on the cusp of some really, really exciting projects, particularly on the timber front, where I think there's a huge opportunity, and in Scotland's food and drink sector as well, uh, looking at whiskey and other Scottish produce. Uh, we are, as I say, on, on the cusp, without being able to say too much at this particular committee meeting, but we're on the cusp of some really exciting opportunities on freight. And if we crack some of those, then I think it will really open the, the, the floodgates uh, for a number of other schemes being developed. And we have obviously government funds in, in, in order to assist the freight facilities grant and others to, to, to help to shift, as I say, freight from road onto, onto rail. So what are some of the specific negatives about freight consolidation centres? 
Well, again, I mean, uh, others will be able to furnish the, the, the committee with a, a little bit more uh, detail on that. But it's not that they're a negative, it's just that perhaps they haven't quite had the impact that people would uh, have expected uh, them to have. And, and there's also some concerns uh, from, from the business community, as you would understand, and, and, and so on and so forth. But mainly, actually, it's not about a negative, it's more that perhaps uh, they haven't quite had the impact. But we're still viewing it with an open mind, I should say. I'm, I'm not taking it off the table by any stretch of the imagination. And if, uh, looking at other parts of the UK where they have free consolidation centres, but, you know, again, it's, an er it's early days to take a definitive view on that, but it just maybe hasn't quite had the impact that people maybe necessarily would have, would have thought. Thanks. Let's move this on then. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning to you all. Um, I'd like to turn our focus to active travel, which um, you've already highlighted, Minister, um, briefly in your remarks. Um, we heard from Craig McLaren of the Institute for Town Planning Scotland uh, that although it is in, in CAFs, I would like to see, um, I would like there to be more. I would like greater recognition of the role active travel can play. The doubling of the budget for active travel is a step in the right direction. And, uh, but we need to make sure that it is used in the right way and that it has the maximum impact. So it would be helpful if um, you could share with us your thoughts at this stage on, on that, Minister, and also not to forget um, the national walking strategy as well, as that is a robust part of active travel. Yes, I would uh, re reiterate what the member said about the walking strategy, sometimes overlooked, but, you know, it's... Um, you know, the easiest form of active travel really isn't it? You don't need too many, you know, too, too much fancy equipment uh, for it. You good pair of trainers, uh, preferably, or uh, if you wish to, to be a bit more uh, energetic, uh, hiking boots and so on and so forth. So, you know, as o overlooked, and uh, just going back to what I said uh, in, in the debate on active travel, uh, when I had uh, Sir Alex Ferguson come to my constituency to open, uh, he, was, he was born in Govan, and so, you know, I had uh, opening a walkway in Govan. Um, he had mentioned that when he was Manchester United manager, the best exercise he could recommend to his players was walking. Uh, and, and as I said in the debate, you know, Alex Ferguson, uh, probably the greatest uh, football manager uh, in modern history after Jock's team. So, you know, it's a good, good point to raise. Um, that was a bit gratuitous. On active travel, the, lo the, the emphasis from stakeholder groups has been that the active travel, doubling of the active travel budget has been very welcomed but we've got to make sure we spend it in the right way. So we get the absolute most bang for our buck. And I had a very early conversation with the stakeholders that the member will be aware of and that she meets with on, on a regular basis and I meet with on a regular basis to start to tease out what some of that will look like. Now, I would say that it doesn't mean that we have to <coughs> chuck out everything we've done before because a big part of that money, uh, a large part of that money, sorry, will, will be spent on infrastructure. And I'm a big believer that cycling infrastructure, segregated cycling infrastructure in particular, is really important to give people confidence to get on their bikes. So there's a big part of, uh, sorry, a large part of the money that will be used on, on uh, cycling infrastructure. Behavioural change, for sure. There's a lot of work for us to do, uh, in my opinion, on, on behavioural change and, and emphasising some of the, the many benefits that cycling can promote, and not just the health benefits, which we talk about, all the, the, the physical health benefits, obviously the mental health benefits, but also trying to behavioural change in respect to uh, drivers, many of whom are cyclists themselves, but also, for example, to businesses, and saying, look, actually, if you have more of your employees um, engaged in active travel, you have a more productive workforce, and so on and so forth, as the evidence bears out. And, you know, there's many good examples of, of um, businesses uh, doing that. And then there should be a focus, uh, as the Liberal Democrat amendment in the Act of Travel debate highlighted, uh, on training and training for cycle training for young people. Um, I'm a great believer in early intervention. Uh, and then there'll be some of that money we, we talked about with the cycling or lobbying organisations that some of that money should also be used on, uh, as I would describe it, some, some out of the box thinking, some let's trial some, some things in Scotland that. Um, they, 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 you know, uh, I think Scotland has always been a good test bed, and I think we should not be afraid um, of uh, trying out some new initiatives and incentives uh, to get people uh, cycling and being active, uh, uh, whether that's through walking actually or, or cycling. So, you know, I've tasked 
uh, my officials to work closely with those cycling organisations to come forward. And, you know, there's no lack of ideas or enthusiasm from them at all. Uh, and as I say, clearly, we're going to have to make sure we get the most bang for the buck uh, of that budget for the reasons uh, the members already mentioned, that very ambitious uh, vision uh, that we have, uh, but also for, for the importance in our health outcomes. Thank you. Could I focus our minds very specifically on the 10% of journeys being made by bike by 2020? And we've had comment when we took oral evidence um, uh, on air quality specifically um, recently from um, Stephen Thompson of Transport Scotland, who said, and I quote, colleagues in Transport Scotland seem confident about working towards that target. There are others, as you will know, Minister, who are far less confident. And if you could um, uh, highlight some of the ways in which you are um, confident, as well as your officials, um, yeah, having highlighted that. I mean, the first thing to say, of course, is it's a vision. Uh, and yes, it's going to be difficult. I fully accept that. That's the point that the member uh, has made to me previously. And I think if we get hung up on, uh, you know, uh, absolutely you know, meeting that vision or that vision or that vision, then, you know, we're gonna, we can be in danger of losing sight of, of, of the bigger picture. Don't get me wrong, I think we should absolutely be striving to get to that 10% by 2020 without a shadow of a doubt. And that is why we've seen, for example, the doubling of the active travel budget, which look, is popular initiative between you know myself and, and, and the member, but you know there's many other people who who have asked me you know is, is that the right priority? And I've been very robust in saying absolutely right, but you know uh, that is a, a significant record level increase uh, in that. So yes, that, that that is why we've doubled that active travel budget. It's why also I'm saying I said to the member in my previous answer, I have to ensure I get the most bang for the buck because I want to try as try as hard as I possibly can to get us towards that 2020. Uh, target um, and it's going to be difficult it's going to be absolutely challenging but putting the funding uh, doubling the funding is certainly uh, in my view uh, going to significantly help us uh, to, to, to get there thank you and lastly I, uh, I should have declared uh, an interest because I am a co-convener um, uh, of the cross-party group for what is now cycling walking and buses which I think is important um, moving on from the previous parliament where it was cycling um, and that integration but could I ask you specifically minister and also whether um, the cabinet secretary has any comment on how um, you're working uh, in in your departments and across um, uh, and in discussion with other um, portfolios to look at how active travel uh, will actually um, help the air quality ambitions? That was, I mean, certainly part of uh, considerations uh, without uh, any shadow of a doubt. And, and another part of that conversation is looking at electric bikes. Mm. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I am very, very keen that my officials, they know this, explore um, the use of electric vehicle, uh, electric bikes, sorry, uh, alongside, uh, as we say, we a lot of emphasis on electric vehicles, but we should be looking at electric bikes. Uh, you know, they can make what might be usually kind of difficult five kilometre journey for some people uh, very manageable uh, and very easy, particularly in sometimes Scotland's more uh, hillier uh, uh, landscape. Mm. So, uh, you know, that that's part of the conversation, part of the emphasis. I'm really, really pleased, I should say, and heartened to hear uh, that the cross-party group also now includes buses and its title and its conversation. This was a point that was raised mm. with me directly by, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying it, by um, uh, MD of uh, McGill's Buses, Ralph Roberts, who, you know, had mentioned to me that... Uh, uh, you know, he's looked at a number of initiatives that he thinks would increase uh, cycle uh, cycle space uh, on his bus. For example, racks at the front, as you've seen in some uh, European cities. But uh, apparently, there's a there's a regulatory or legislative impediment. I think he said, suggested to me a UK impediment uh, to to that. And I said to him, look, I'll work constructively with with the UK government to try to see if we can work around that. So I'm really pleased because integration of transport is hugely important. That's why we've had numerous conversations about how to increase cycle spaces on, on trains and the new HSTs that will be coming in uh, next year as well. So I think that point uh, is hugely important. So going back to our original question, though, yes, I mean, I can give her an absolute assurance and guarantee that when we talk about uh, low emission zones, that, uh, you know, uh, sorry, improving air quality, that um, uh, active travel is a, a very vital component uh, of that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mark Roscoe. I just wondered if there's a consistent level of ambition from local authorities in terms of implementing the kind of measures that are needed to push for active travel. So let's take 20 mile an hour speed limits, for example. Government policy is to push 
20 mile an hour speed limits in residential areas <coughs> where where cars mix with vehicle, where cars mix with uh, cyclists and also pedestrians as well and yet there is an inconsistency if you look at Dundee there's only a couple of streets that have got 20 mile an hour zones if you look in Fife virtually every single residential area has been designated as 20 so are there issues in terms of consistency on that and other measures around Scotland and how do you how do you push that on the wider, I'll address this point on 20, 20 mile per hour zones, which uh, the member obviously has a, has a great interest in and uh, has been doing a lot of work on in relation to zone bill. Uh, but the general point on aligning policy is hopefully something I answered previously that when I, when I, when I answered a, a question from Donald Cameron, which was that there's not a magic wand for this kind of stuff. It's only going to happen through engagement, through focused steering groups that we already have, through holding events like I did jointly with COSLA to try to re-emphasise the message and, and, and through where we may have appropriate levers through funding, for example, of low emission zones and so on and so forth. So but there is there is no 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 uh, silver bullet or magic wand in, in order to have absolute one hundred percent alignment between uh, what our ambitions and targets are and visions are with local authorities, but we're working obviously very closely with local authority partners, regional transport partnerships, and others to to try to get to that position. Uh, in terms of, of of the twenty mile per hour zone, it still remains the government's position very much that local authorities uh, should have discretion because there are some local factors that may well, uh, you know, make it uh, absolutely right for uh, local authorities to designate a road thirty as opposed to twenty. Now the members are aware of that because I note, note in his own proposals that um, that uh, he's examining and exploring that issue uh, as well in relation to a, a more blanket approach. Can I just emphasise what I've already said to the member previously, that I, I keep an open mind in government um, on this. I do think there are some practical and pragmatic issues we're going to have to do. Really, uh, he will have to consider, and obviously we'll, we'll raise them with him in the course of the debate on, on his bill. I also welcome the opportunity the member's given me to brief me on, I think, the over 2,000 consultation responses or there or thereabouts that he's had uh, to his bill, So, uh, which I understand are are vastly uh, in, in favour of uh, his proposals, but I'd be keen to, to speak to him one-to-one -to, -one to understand a little bit more about that. Um, that probably all I'll say on, on 20 mile per hour OK, thank you for that. Let's move this on to uh, Finley Carson. I mean, I'd like to move to, to tackling uh, particular air quality hotspots. We received uh, written uh, evidence uh, proposing a range of measures how to actually pr prioritise air quality uh, improvement in certain areas, uh, particularly those have, who have been in uh, persistent breach of nitrogen uh, oxides. Um, we, we heard that uh, Aberdeen uh, City Council, uh, they, they're suggesting that, that, that we should be more targeted. Now, you've already said that there's not one size fits all, uh, and, and there may need to be a, a range of different actions to, to address particular hotspots. Can I ask, out with uh, the CAFs and, and also out with what, what might be included in local air quality action plans. What quick, quick wins do you see there being to tackle hotspots um, that could be included, for example, installation of uh, green walls with moss on them uh, to, to absorb some of the pollutants, uh, the use of dust uh, suppressants or, or even subsidised uh, travel passes? I think if there were any really obvious quick wins, we would already be um, able to, to, to look to implementing them. There are some of the areas in the, um, particularly when I look at the top <coughs> 10 and the, you know, these, the, these lists of places where um, the, there are major issues, that, that there is not an obvious, necessarily obvious way that you could fix that. I mean, I made very kind of, big reference to the fact that I live in Creef, and Creef is sitting there as one of the top six, top six exceeding for particulate matter. But Creef's High Street, which is what this is measuring, is part of a trunk road. So, um, you know, green walls are not going to work. One of the problems here is actually buses. Um, choked into a small area. So um, increasing the number of buses at this particular moment, won't, um, so that I'm not wanting to kind of create a problem. I think if there was a really easy answer, then we would be able to find it. Um, the low emission zones, I suspect, are going to be the quickest, biggest win mm. here. 
they are the one they, they are I suspect what is going to create the biggest difference um, and uh, um, certainly I would be hoping that those areas that are in Glasgow Aberdeen Dundee that are particularly bad um, will see quite speedy benefits uh, from them um, and that's obviously much larger scale um, than, than what is being talked about. I may say that, you know, where I live, rather astonishingly for me, um, our bus timetables have just literally been doubled. So uh, what was an hourly service to Perth has now, is now half hourly, and what was a two hourly service to Stirling is now hourly. So the likelihood is that's going to increase the number of people on the buses, but it also increases the number of buses and at the moment, there's the issue about trying to get buses moved over to green buses. So there, some things will, will, will not necessarily work. Lots of areas where there will be some difficulties. And I think the bigger scale idea around something like low emission zone is what's actually going to deliver the biggest hits the soonest. But you're not going to get a low emission zone in Creef anytime soon or in Spring Home and Crockett Ford where the A75 travels through or... Uh, well, but, but arguably we have to come up with some kind of plan that, that, that you know, we can't simply ignore those areas. Um, but, but the, you know, the, the, we all recognise where the biggest problems are. I mean, most people will not recognise these as being, you know, nationally significant problems. I guess that's how people will look at it. The people do understand that Glasgow and Edinburgh and Dundee and Aberdeen are that. And, and that's why I think if there was very easy, um, quick wins for the cities, which is where the biggest problems are, then, uh, uh, then we, we would be finding them. Um, you know, the active travel debate is interesting, but I, I, I find it, and I'm you know, hoping my colleague here doesn't mind me saying this, a lot of the walking cycling discussion tends to talk about walking and cycling as if it was recreational activity. And it, that only works in terms of air quality if we're persuading people to replace their car journeys with the walking and the cycling. Because if we don't replace the car journeys with something better, then, uh, um, then it doesn't necessarily have the impact that we want it to have. So there are lots of places and lots of issues in which the interplay doesn't always work. Um, um, uh, as best we might hope. And that's why the notion of there being some simple magic wand quick wins, I think we've got to approach with a degree of caution uh, because it won't necessarily in the shorter term deliver the kind of results we're wanting. If, if we're moving away from the, the, the big four again, it's, is there enough of a joined up approach being considered? Uh, are, are, can we consider accountability being written into the single outcome agreement uh, or the joint health protection plans within councils? Um, well, I, I guess that's a matter for local authorities to consider whether or not these issues should be in their uh, um, single outcome agreement. I mean, I certainly would like to see that uh, um, uh, if, if that was possible, but I don't think we don't mandate the single outcome agreements. We, we, you know, we talk to local authorities about the development of them, it is collaborative, but we're not imposing single outcome agreements on local authorities and nor, I suspect, would local authorities welcome an attempt to impose single outcome agreements. But this goes back to some of the conversations that we've been having about a wider engagement about a lot of these issues and ensuring um, that everybody involved understands the implications of some of the decisions that are being made. Right. Um, I think we've got three themes we want, still want to cover, so <coughs> top, top questions and answers would be welcome. Uh, David Stewart. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Convener. Um, you'll know that we took some evidence from the Greater London Authority, and they were doing a lot of work around schools which are in disadvantaged areas, which are subject to very high pollution. Is there any work that the Scottish Government's doing around uh, similar examples within Scotland? Uh, well, we, we don't have um, specific plans related to um, schools particularly, um, uh, uh, but clearly there are schools that will be in part of these hotspots, and so they will be a part of the discussion that is taking place in respect of uh, low emission zones. We think at the moment um, our current monitoring programme is enough to pick up any particular 
issues. I mean, there isn't an issue at every school. There are, there are mm. very particular areas where that might be uh, a, a concern. Um, but at the moment, we're, uh, you know, while we absolutely recognise the issue of, of air quality on health and specifically the vulnerable groups that have, are the biggest impacted, so that's not just the elderly with respiratory ailments, mm. but young people um, with respiratory ailments. But we, we think at the moment that the monitoring network across Scotland um, uh, is, uh, is the best way to use uh, our, our resources um, and uh, um, uh, it means that monitors are located in the area of most concern and that might or might not include schools. Yeah, just, well, that, that, just to add to that, sorry, uh, if, if, if I may, is that um, keep aware of our guidelines, and they are guidelines around 20 mile per hour zones and uh, schools, for example, uh, and, and, and roads around schools, um, certainly being candidates uh, for, for uh, reducing the speed limit to 20 mile per zone, which is largely for road safety reasons, but obviously meet air quality uh, objectives as well. And then what I would say is, we're com as, as part of the doubling of the active travel budget, we're giving serious consideration about how we ramp up um, and bikeability, or some people don't say cycle, cycle proficiency, but um, you know, getting our young people in primary schools, uh, getting them trained on their bikes, both within the safety and sanctuary of a playground, but also giving them on-road uh, training uh, as well, which is part of bikeability. That, um, can, we, that, can I go back to the Cabinet Secretary's point about monitoring? You'll know also we took evidence from uh, Ricardo Energy and Environment, and they made the point that the, they felt there should be more automatic monitoring stations in Scotland. You know there's currently 95, roughly three uh, per council. Their criticism really was that the data is not good enough from the current uh, diffusion tubes. I know this is a technical point, but it's perhaps maybe one for the officials to answer. But is this something that the Scottish Government are conscious of, the lack of automatic uh, monitors and the lack of the poor data allegedly coming from the existing technology? Well, I, I mean, our view at the moment is that um, we are operating a comprehensive monitoring network. I mean, you know, we could always uh, argue or make an argument for, uh, um, you know, the numbers of these stations to be increased exponentially, um, but uh, you would then be increasing them perhaps in areas where the greatest need isn't always. So we are, you know, constantly keeping that uh, under review. Um, I also need to say that that is very expensive. These are not cheap pieces of kit. So we need to think quite carefully about where they should be deployed. Mm. And uh, do you have any response to the criticism about the, um, the poor data from the diffusion tubes that's the current technology? Uh, I would have to um, ask for more specific technical um, briefing on diffusion tubes. Um, Perhaps you I could. will do that. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I, sure. the, mm -hmm. the, the, the technicalities around that are... I, I wasn't expecting great. the Cabinet Secretary to <laughs> do that, much as I admire the Cabinet Secretary's uh, ability to uh, be able to answer questions. The final uh, point I have, um, Convener, is Sustrans made an interesting point, and they said um, that the legal requirement to protect people in local air quality management areas, and I'm quoting, is vague and there's no penalty for failing to reduce harmful air pollution. Do you agree, Cabinet Secretary? What well, there, sh th th there should be some kind of legal recourse for. Well, um, I, I, I think one would have to be very cautious about that because one of the, one of the issues that we deal with there is that um, the direct relationship to air quality and public health, uh, there are so many factors involved in that that it would be quite difficult, I think, to, to specifically narrow down for the purposes of a court action, which I guess is what is ultimately... Uh, considered here um, uh, uh, and you know um, that speaking from somebody given my previous profession as a lawyer um, would allow endless get out clauses. Mm. Well do local authorities currently have powers to carry out spot checks and vehicles to ensure they comply with their yeah, quality My understanding standards? is they do um, uh, uh, that, that there is a kind of power to do um, precisely that, um, and that there is financial support through the uh, Scottish Government uh, allowing them to, um, to do that, uh, to undertake roadside emission testing if they, if they wish, 
um, and to target idling vehicles. And idling vehicles is the thing that I get quite a lot of constituency mm. mail about and is one of, the, one of those things that I think mm. that needs to be dealt with, I suspect, mm. um, is, the, is, the, is the cause of some of the top ten um, and, and will that local authorities that have LEZs have more powers than other local authorities that don't have LEZs? Um, Again, that comes down to, obviously, the consultation that's just yeah. taking place in terms of the legal framework, the national framework, <laughs> and will come down to the scope. Uh, local, different local authorities may well want a different scope, different enforcement measures, uh, and so on and so forth. I thought the, um, the John Scott's point around um, ensuring that the legal framework is in place uh, for the introduction of LEZs was absolutely important, and I've given a commitment that uh, we'll certainly that we'll certainly be working towards that, of course, as our commitment is to introduce our first low emission zone by, by 2018. I know something the members uh, pushed us on um, repeatedly uh, as well. So uh, you might well have a, a different um, approach to enforcement depending on how the local authority wishes to take forward a low emission zone. Our job in government uh, is to hopefully ensure that the legislative uh, legislative uh, levers are, 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 are there. Fine. Will that, and will that require primary legislation or you can do this by statutory interim or secondary legislation? Again, we'll have to look at uh, you know, what the consultation responses are, how far people want us to go, how far we need to go in order to get the outcomes that we wish to, to, to achieve. So if the member won't mind, I'll, I'll reserve judgment sure. on that specific. But I'll, I'll look back at that and once we have some early indications, I'll make sure the com via the committee, the convener, of course, uh, the committee is in informed okay. of our plans. Right, thank you. And John Scott thank and you. Finlay Carson. Just very briefly on that point, uh, Minister, I mean, this will probably need to be introduced by subordinate legislation, and given the likely bottleneck of subordinate legislation coming through, could I just put on the record the, the thought, at any rate, that it would be well worth having um, this job done and dusted as soon as possible, given um, uh, the Government and, and the Parliament's ability to deal with uh, an expected increase in secondary legislation about the, the critical time it's going to be required for LEZs. Yeah. So some early work has already been done in terms of uh, identifying the appropriate secondary legislation uh, in order to just be a, uh, enable low emission zones to be introduced by 2018. I suppose my point was further to, to David Stewart's point if that uh, there's further legislation required primary, secondary in relation to enforcement or any other scope a low emissions, uh, that a local authority wants to bring forward, then clearly we'd have to to give that consideration in our, uh, I take the member's point, uh, absolutely, that uh, clearly we need to move very, very quickly on that. But in order to get the, the introduction of low emission zones, yes, the, the, the secondary legislation for that, uh, we're, we're well uh, aware of and uh, uh, already conversations on, on how and when to take that forward. Okay. Uh, briefly, Finlay Carson. Thanks very, very much. Uh, Earlier early in the sessions, uh, we, we've had a number of witnesses saying that the the, the amount of data that's available now, the information that's available through maybe the Met Office or automatic number plate recognition, uh, or you know looking at congestion charges, whatever, and, and given your statement that the, the, the cost of actual physical detectors uh, and and the lack of them or, or the, the shortage of them only three per uh, council, th there was a suggestion that, that there could be more joined up thinking to to produce. Uh, better modelling, which would uh, give indications of uh, pollution and, and hotspots, whatever. But there was a lack of anybody to facilitate joined-up thinking. Given the costs and and and, and the concerns regarding uh, air quality, is that not something the Scottish government should be doing? Actually, facilitating joined-up thinking uh, with all the data out there to, to reduce the cost and monitoring air quality. Shortage of um, uh, were phrases you've used. Um, they weren't phrases that I used. Um, I did indicate that you know one could argue an exponential increase. Um, whether that would necessarily help or not is another matter. I think I did say in response to a very much earlier question that SIPA was uh, undertaking modelling work, which we think will be of assistance to local authorities. So it's not that these issues are not being looked at. They are. Um, and uh, uh, I would expect that there will be um, lively discussions uh, at the leadership group and uh, uh, other forums um, about precisely that. Okay. Uh, Angus MacDonald. The issue of air monitoring stations and AQMAs, which, uh, which have uh, been, been raised uh, just quite recently. Um, the, the, cabs, the Cabinet Secretary and the, the Minister may be aware that the Committee uh, visited Kostorfin um, and the Kostorfin Community Council 
in October, um, and I hasten to add that we travelled by service bus, um, and 10 out of 10 to, to the Lorraine buses uh, for the service that they provide. Now, there's a, a, an AQMA in place uh, in Kostorfin and a monitoring station. Um, now, they've seen NO2 exceedances improve over the short period, uh, or over short periods of time. However, the annual mean limit um, continues to be exceeded. Um, and the short-term improvement has been put down to changes to the traffic flow at the adjacent junction, which you, you, you probably both, uh, both know, and um, cleaner buses. However, uh, the council officer that attended the meeting stated that it's difficult to pinpoint the exact reason. So with that example in mind, um, how can public bodies be, be certain that actions taken to improve air quality at known hotspots is being effective? Um, uh, I think, um, and I'm looking through the briefing because I know that in here somewhere there is an indication of areas where it is quite clear um, that actions have t made a, a considerable different, uh, difference. So those sorts of um, uh, those sorts of areas um, are important to uh, 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 important to emphasise um, to others, and I'm just looking if I can, if you'll give, just give me a minute or two to kind of pull up the relevant section. I know I saw um, in the briefing a very clear uh, list of places where one could argue that it was the actions taken uh, as a result of the um, AQMA. Ah, right, okay, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, uh, St John's Road in Edinburgh is certainly one of those where one can point directly to um, uh, uh, um, improvements. Um, there are others um, which have two, so that's not um, a one-off. Um, Cooper and Fife um, uh, is, is another area, and again, it's an interesting one that it's back to areas that are not necessarily um, uh, um, in a city. Grangemouth, um, where there's been uh, a lot of collaborative work done, and I know the member will probably have an interest in that particular area. <laughs> Um, Pathhead Midlothian, um, where Midlothian Councils has actually been able to revoke their air quality management uh, area. Um, uh, it had been uh, uh, declared for domestic emissions of particulate matter, um, uh, but the revocation um, was, uh, took place after um, the village was connected to the gas grid. So there are um, areas where specific actions have actually meant that uh, AQMAs um, have resulted in very positive outcomes. Um, the trick, I suppose, is being able to develop actions under AQMAs that actually very, fit very much um, uh, uh, for those very local circumstances. And there might be some, and this is, goes back to the quick wins kind of argument, at the level of this kind of thing, there may be some issues that are quick wins, um, uh, but we won't necessarily know all of them because they are being done at such a local um, local level. Okay, thanks. Um, you you right, rightly raised the issue of, of Grangemouth, where there was an SO2 uh, issue uh, and exceedances there. Um, however, Enios did invest uh, about £70 million in a sulphur recovery unit, which uh, which clearly had um, a, a positive impact. Um, but Cooper and Fife, the changes um, came about because they, there was a change to traffic signalling. Um, and the traffic flow um, uh, uh, was was changed, um, and that led to a reduction in nitrogen dioxide. So, in very local areas, it can sometimes be quite small things. Okay, thanks. Um, we've uh, also taken written evidence, um, which ironically um, blames the rise in air pollution on traffic calming measures uh, by influencing acceleration and deceleration. Uh, for example, at many roundabouts, speed humps pedestrian and cycling specific zones and with apologies to Mark Ruskell, uh, 20 mile per hour zones as well. Um, I was wondering what your views would be on that. Can you say the first part of your question again? Sorry, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, we've taken evidence um, uh, uh, which blames the rise in, in air pollution on uh, the measures that they... Uh, I've seen some of that and, and again my apologies to Mark Ruskell too. <coughs> in, in, in our first meeting, which I'm sure you won't mind me saying, in the first meeting that we had around 20 mile per hour zones, I did make the point that the, the, there was uh, some evidence 
that 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 uh, you know showed a, a rise, uh, as he rightly said, uh, or or, or worsening uh, uh, picture for air quality in relation to 20 mile per hour zones. But having examined and explored the issue in more detail, there's much more evidence to the contrary uh, to that. So, um, you know, uh, for me, uh, I think we're absolutely going uh, in the right direction here, doubling the active travel budget. Uh, low emission zones, uh, the work we're doing on electric vehicles and, and, and the ambitious uh, programme that we have in relation to phasing out the need for, for diesel and petrol cars by 2032 and in relation to 20 mile per hour zones. Uh, I'm aware of the evidence the member talks, but uh, I would say to him, it uh, sounds to me there's a lot more evidence to the, to the contrary to that. And so we'll continue to, to hold our position. But as I said to, to Mark Ruskell previously, just keep an open mind. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Vina, uh, one of the things that's happening across Scotland is the introduction of uh, uh, domestic uh, wood burners and also uh, in commercial premises biomass boilers. Uh, clearly, that's helping the CO2 agenda, but is it damaging particulates and SO2 and, uh, and noxes? And if so, what can we do? Yeah, I, I, I think, and of course, they're very um, attractive wood burners, so people want to have them. Um, and I, I, I suspect questions have been getting asked about this for quite a while. Um, I think we'd have to say that um, the modern versions of the stoves and boilers are probably sufficiently high standard to deal with some of those um, particular earlier questions. Um, uh, so... Uh, the the um, uh, but but we there is an issue about I guess about testing appliances in in uh, in uh, smoke control areas. Now I don't live in one of those, so I I'm not quite sure how that in in fact uh, operates. Um, uh, there is, and we're back to our friend planning because there are usually um, there, there are permitted development rights, which means that local authorities don't have much of a handle on how many of these um, uh, things are out there. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and unless they're actually in an air quality management area, it'll be difficult for local authorities to, uh, to really try and assess the impact uh, because they won't know the number of installations um, and therefore it's hard to, to monitor the impact. Um, I, I think this is one of the, the kind of developments that suggest to us that the Clean Air Act does need to be updated because the Clean Air Act kind of predates this move um, and is back to some of the interrelationships between policies that, in a sense, have both a good and a bad side um, uh, uh, to them. Um, I am uh, aware that uh, local authorities have, have recently completed a survey amongst themselves about complaints uh, uh, for, uh, about smoke and odour. Um, I'm told they're going to be writing to the government about their findings shortly. So um, this is obviously something which is moving up the agenda. Um, uh, and um, uh, we are aware of it. But at the moment, I don't think there are any immediately obvious solutions. I think this is finally. Um, we've got two members of the ministerial team in front of us today. It's suggested that uh, a number of European countries are uh, successfully doing things in uh, agriculture uh, that might help this agenda. Clearly, that's not the minister's responsibility. So my, my sort of open question is, uh, uh, can uh, the ministers who are here identify others of their colleagues who can have... Uh, a good side or a bad side effect uh, on this particular agenda uh, so that if necessary the committee can engage with them too. I want crossed off. Aye, well, quite. <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think the member knows perfectly well which other portfolio will have an interest in this uh, and in these circumstances it's probably um, uh, would be helpful for the committee to raise it directly um, with that portfolio. Um, we are aware that uh, um, total annual ammonia emissions in Scotland uh, are significantly impacted by emissions from uh, agriculture. Um, but despite 
the automatic assumption that this is about green coups as opposed to non-green coups. The fact is, um, uh, mostly it's from organic and inorganic manure application to soils rather than the coups themselves. Um, and in fairness to coups, I've often wondered if anybody had tried to measure the ammonia emissions from the human livestock on the planet, but I suppose there's a difficulty about going there. <laughs> yes. yes. So lavender fields round uh, silage. Can we... <laughs> Can I just make one observation on, on Stuart Stevenson's point? Uh, I'm going to try to raise the tone uh, <laughs> after that remark. Which, which was, um, when I first became uh, a minister a number of years ago, uh, Minister for International Development, I was in ex external affairs and international development. I was sitting around the subcommittee on, on climate change that we had at the time. Really? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and I had a real, I was heartened then, as I am now with the recent conversations mm. we've had, around the draft climate change plan, that all the ministers that come in who have you know, relevant portfolios to this, and there's a very open mm. uh, discussion, and you know there, there would be a temptation for ministers to all put their arms around their portfolios and say, no, no, no more. But actually, there's a real collaborative working between ministers. Again, I won't divulge the, the you know, everything that's said in these meetings, of course not, but uh, there's, you know, there's a real collaborative approach across the ministerial team here to say, look, well, we're all trying to get to the same place here, and we have to, because you know, we were committed to do that. Um, and I think you've seen that probably from, from, from the draft climate change plan. Yeah, the climate change plan, um, which is going to be published in February, will include um, issues related to this. I, I could um, advise the committee about um, current action that is uh, being uh, undertaken or looked at, but I will ask my colleague in the other portfolio if he would um, prefer to write um, formally to the committee to, to update the committee. Uh, thank you. I think that would be useful. There are obviously a number of follow-up items that we've identified today and we'll have the clerks and your officials ways to take that forward. I think that's been a very useful extended session this morning. Uh, I thank you for your time, both of you. Um, at its next meeting on the 12th of December, the committee will hear evidence from various stakeholders on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you.